new blockbuster movie, White Boy Rick, starring Oscar winner Matthew McConaughey, is in the movie theaters right now. It's about the life of teenage drug dealer Rick Wershey, who remains behind bars after being sent to prison at the age of 18. Well, for the first time after seeing the movie, I sat down for a one-on-one -on -one interview with Wershey's sister, who's angry about the way her family was portrayed in the movie. <laughs> We were portrayed in the film as like that. low class, yeah, dirt poor, just scuzz bags. I'm not gonna let you ruin your life, Don. No drugs in the house. Ah! I don't know what other word to use. I mean, and that's not the way it was. Don Scott and her brother Rick Worshi, better known as White Boy Rick, were raised by their dad on the east side of Detroit in what used to be a middle class neighborhood. She says the way her grandparents, who are now deceased, were depicted on the big screen hurt the most. They helped raise them and lived right across the street. They looked like a bunch of derelict drunks that just didn't care and were wild and crazy, and that's the farthest thing. They were the most meek and upright people you would ever meet. Oscar winner Matthew McConaughey plays Rick's dad. What upsets you the most? What has he said? Well, he said that my dad couldn't handle us kids and that he had Rick sell drugs because he couldn't cut the mustard to pay the bills. And that's the farthest thing, farthest thing from the truth. Dawn was only 17 when her brother, only 14, started wheeling and dealing drugs. Dawn says he was an undercover informant for the FBI for six months to a year until he was shot and severely injured. I mean, here they were using a child as an underage informant, which I would think is against all types of laws. Unlike in the movie, she says her dad, who also made statements to the FBI, was outraged and wanted Rick out of the drug business when he came home with $50,000 in drug money. Rick refused, so my dad took the money and threw my ex-husband and Rick out. Don says Rick bought a house down the street and kept rolling. Crack cocaine was the cheap drug of choice. Selling drugs is sort of like a, a gambler. You know, when you win that jackpot, you want more. You know there's a bigger one out there. In the movie, you said they portrayed you as a heroin addict. Well, they never really say what, but we're all assuming that is, that is the drug of choice just by the way the character acts, which I've never done heroin in my life. Don says what they did get right was how white boy Rick came to be. That's how Rick was. That's what Rick did. He did his own thing. Don says what you see in this Hollywood film was born out of the media circus surrounding white boy Rick that began in Detroit. It was, it was like he was a rock star, and he wasn't. But it, it made him more than what he was. Patient leading to the arrest of family members and associates of former Detroit Mayor Coleman Young, as well as the allegation about Coleman's political ally, Gil Hill. In 2016, a notorious former Detroit hitman alleged that Gil Hill had once tried to commission hit on Richard Bershey. Richard and his working class family live in a neighborhood on the east side of Detroit, about seven miles from the city center. They resided there during a period from the mid 1980s to the early 1990s, when Detroit and many other major cities were gaining widespread reputations for crime and violence, largely due to an influx of white girl in the emergence of the hard white stuff epidemic. Richard's father was also an FBI snitch and first reported to the police and the feds alongside him before doing it alone. The name White Boy Rick wasn't a street name that Richard gave himself, nor was it one he was ever called by those whom he befriended. The name came from reporters that covered his case. When he was 16, the FBI having secured 20 convictions through his infiltration of a violent drug gang, ceased to employ him as an informant. In 1987, at 17 years old, he was arrested for possessing white girl in an excessive amount of 18 pounds. He was sentenced to life in prison in Michigan under the state 650 Lifer Law, a narcotic statute passed in 1973 that penalized those found in possession of more than 650 grams, which is equivalent to 23 ounces of white girl or heroin with life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The law was overturned, but he was rejected as a menace to society by the Michigan Parole Board in 2008, despite having assisted the FBI in the 90s with a sting unsuccessfully targeting Gil Hill and drawing in the relatives of influential city politicians. Publicity about the case in 2017, by which time he has spent nearly 30 years behind bars in Michigan as a nonviolent narcotic offender 
whose offense was committed when he was 17, led to him being paroled, but immediately to U.S. Marshals who took him to, again, another five-year sentence in Florida State Prison on a 2008 car theft ring conviction that he committed while locked up. In 2019, his application was denied by the Florida Clemency Board. On July 20th, 2020, Richard Reshi was released from custody in Florida, having completed his sentence with credits for good behavior. In July 2021, he sued the FBI, stating in the lawsuit that had he not been an informant for the task force, he would have never have gotten involved with gangs or criminality of any sort, and that the FBI's actions amounted to child abuse. In November 1984, he was called to a house. He didn't disclose who called him, but he was in the basement when an associate shot him with a 357 Magnum. The bullet ripped through his large intestine. All he remembered was waking up at the bottom of the stairs in agonizing pain. He was 15 years old. He thought he was going to die. The suspect's girlfriend arrived within a minute. Panicking, she called 911. The suspect and his girlfriend put Richard in a car, ready to transport him to a hospital or to a secluded place to die. He wasn't sure, and as they pulled out, an ambulance blocked the car. He recalled a paramedic telling the suspect they were taking him. Thank God his girlfriend showed up. Thank God she called 911 or he probably wouldn't be here today. Here might have been a fine time for the police to reflect on the pitfalls of employing a teenager as a snitch. Instead, they went to the hospital and instructed Richard to describe the incident as an accident to boost his street credibility, the lawsuit states. Within six months, they threw him back into the snitch game, providing him accommodations, money, <clears throat> and a bogus ID to continue his undercover work in Vegas where several Detroit drug lords were attending a bout between Thomas Hearns, a favorite son of the Motor City, ironically nicknamed the Hitman, and Marvelous Marvin Hagler. This also in the lawsuit. The media reported that Richard was too naive to fathom the foolishness of being a familiar white face in a city where seven in 10 residents were African-American and locals were demanding the answers to the narcotic scourge. The feds and local police cut off contact by this time he was 16, likely to save their asses from legal action should they have been caught using a 14, 15 year old as a narcotic dealer snitch. Richard had become a celebrity of the worst kind known to reporters. Gang members and police who had no idea he was informing because officers had used his father's name on the paperwork. <clears throat> he told CNN News that if that's not child endangerment of the highest level, he doesn't know what you call it. There were at least three more attempts on his life, including one in which bullets narrowly missed his father as he sat in his living room watching TV. In the 2017 documentary, White Boy, contract killer Nate Boonecraft, who served only 17 years after turning a snitch himself, recalled his two attempts to kill Richard. The orders were sent from a now deceased prominent city official. Nate Boone said, Richard had snitched that Gil Hill was in a cover-up involving a drive-by shooting and murder of a 13 year old boy. Nate Boone, the hitman, was ordered to take white boy Rick out because Gil Hill heard that he was snitching. Gil allegedly said that they had to make sure that it led back to no one. Nate Boone reassured Gil that all his hits didn't lead back to anyone. Richard got away by the skin of his teeth at an intersection just north of Interstate 94. Nate Boone crap pulled alongside Richard's vehicle and his accomplice began shooting but the map jammed on them. Nate later tried to kill Richard using a scoping rifle before a court hearing, but the team used an underground entrance into the courthouse. Richard Worshi's narcotic dealing days ended on May 22, 1987. The then 17-year-old and a friend were pulled over and Richard ran. Police caught him, severely beating him enough to go to the hospital and later informed him that they received a tip which led them to 18 pounds of white girl they said he stashed in a neighbor's backyard. Richard is candid about his drug dealing. When he was pulled over, he was carrying a knot of drug proceeds. He thought he was still under police protection, but the box of white stuff, which contained far more than 650 grams, was a setup. To this day, he still sticks to his story that he was a, that he was set up. He never touched that box of white stuff. One of his FBI handlers visited him in 91 with a federal prosecutor who needed help with a sting targeting dirty police officers and politicians. He promised Richard that he would fight for him. Operation Backbone was a success. 
taking down 13 Detroit police officers and public officials. Richard wasn't released. He was sent to Florida to serve his time in witness protection, cutting him off from his family for 14 years. While serving time in Florida, he was implicated in a stolen car ring, which he disputes. He pleaded guilty to racketeering after prosecutors threatened to arrest his mother and sister. He is a father of three 30-something children, all born in the three years prior to his sentence, was in the hole, aka segregation in prison in Florida in 2005 when a correctional officer told him his oldest daughter had given birth to his first grandson. Richard missed the birth of six of his grandchildren, one of whom he'll meet for the first time on a road trip to Indiana. His youngest grandchild is seven years old. In the white boy documentary, sources including a gang leader and a convicted drug trafficker telling filmmakers Richard Worshi had no henchmen, no territory. Stories of him being a ruthless kingpin are exaggerated. They said that the legend of white boy Rick isn't true. Since Richard's release in July 2020, he has been working to put his past behind him. His IG feed contains no glorification of his earlier days as a baller. Instead, it shows him golfing, fishing, and hanging out with his fiance, Michelle McDonough. The two met many years prior in middle school and cultivated a romantic relationship about five years ago. White Boy, a documentary, premiered on March 31st, 2017 at the Free Film Festival. It is on Stars and Netflix. White Boy Rick, a biopic, was released on September 14, 2018. Eminem portrays Richard Roshi on TV's on the TV show BMF. Okay, y'all, thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe.